to our small talk today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the icons of Transcona. Uh, today it's myself, Alana Hereda. I'm the museum curator here and joined with me is Jennifer. I'm the assistant curator here at the museum. And before we get started, we will be giving the land acknowledgement. So the Transcona Museum acknowledges that we reside on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Ojukri, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. <laughs> so yes, if you like what we do here at the museum, uh, please consider supporting us. Uh, you can make a donation or become a museum member. You can do that in person or on our website. You can also support us by staying in touch. Um, you can visit our website. We have uh, various social media accounts, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We have a blog. You can also join our mailing list, which uh, we give out about once or twice a month, uh, just giving updates on programs and events that are happening around the museum. So that is how you can support us. And now, whoops. <laughs> Did I start the wrong presentation? No, no, this is the right presentation. Oh, okay, okay. Because we're mostly going to be talking instead of having a, a presentation this time. So um, we only had a couple slots. <laughs> okay. So we're going to stop the show or start stop the slideshow and we will just... You'll just see us. And we're just checking our phones to make sure that... Uh, this is working on live on Facebook. Yes, it is. And we, we also are monitoring the chats on Facebook as well. So yes. You see us looking down. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so we're talking today about the sort of icons of Transcona. So when we say that, essentially, right away, three things come to mind um, to me. And that is High Neighbor Sam. That is the Flamingo and the sort of railway themed railway worker of Transcona. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the histories of what we know about them, how they got started, um, any interesting sort of little factoids. And then um, well, we'll take any questions that anyone might have on um, Facebook. Um, and then if there are no questions, then we'll finish up the presentation today. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're going to do. So uh, first we could start with High Neighbor Sam. Yeah. Um, so High Neighbor Sam essentially came out of, and his name says it all, out of the High Neighbor Festival. Um, now he wasn't present in the very first High Neighbor Festival. And it seems like he was sort of, um, he came up out of a certain, a number of things that happened around the first, second uh, High Neighbor Festival in, um, 1965 in the newspaper there was an ad that said hi neighbor so you know uh, advertising and it was for Mr. Shop and it was advertising uh, costumes for a costume contest and then in 1966 a veterans affairs minister actually visited Transcona and it showed a, a photo of a man with the friendly Transcona hat so the hi neighbor Sam hat and a pin so that you know the idea sort of starting to come up again in august 1966 various ads through various for various businesses transcona hair fashions regent gift shop transcona motors and there was an article uh on roger and i'm Again, why do I get stuck with the last names? Uh, Ty Chonic, and he was becoming president of the JCs. And also, there was an ad for Regent Park Pharmacy, uh, and called Pioneer Days, and it had a caricature of a drawing of a man with a hat and a cane that looked very much like High Neighbor Sam. So there's there's that. So it's the idea is sort of coming, coming, and then. Um, what we did find was an article from 1980. So we're jumping ahead a little bit, but it was an interview um, where, and speaking with Roger Tychonic, who was the JC members. And he said, I had a drawing in a magazine and I added a hat to it and, and put it aside. After the second festival, we decided we needed a symbol uh, and I knew it would be perfect. So the name was actually decided by the festival committee uh, through discussions. 
Um, and then later it was decided, well, they have this drawing of High Neighbor Sam, but they wanted a physical representation of it. Um, and in early 1968, the Festival Association announced that they had commissioned a local sculpture, sculptor here in Transcona, George Barone, and to build an 11 and a half foot high fiberglass and ox light statue of High Neighbor Sam. So uh, again, it quoted in the paper, the erection of the statue will become symbolic of the feeling of the citizens of Transcona and will welcome our neighbors not only uh, once a year during the four days, and originally the festival was four days long, uh, four days of the festival, but for 365 days a year. So it was designed to welcome people to Transcona. The original cost was $4,150. According to that article, the committee there was a committee struck to help raise the uh, the the cost of this that, uh, and it was through generous donations of businessmen and citizens of Transcona that helped pay for it. Um, also, according to the article, High Neighbor Sam was dedicated by Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba Richard S. Bowles as a symbol of friendship and goodwill. Uh, during the official opening of the fourth annual festival in 1968. So that's when Sam first appeared in his physical form. Uh, High Neighbor Sam was placed on the Crossroads Shopping Center parking lot, uh, where he remained up until, now this is the date that I don't know right off the top of my head, but he was moved down prior to the 100th anniversary celebrations in 2012. So I think it was around 2010, 2011, where local Transcona business um, owners and Jean Delorme was one of them uh, really rallied to get High Neighbor Sam moved because he was at that time in the parking lot of the Canadian Tire and he was painted in the Canadian Tire colors not his original High Neighbor Sam colors so he was Jean worked very hard and uh, was able to get the statue moved and now High Neighbor Sam resides just right across from the Regent uh, on Regent Avenue, right across from the Canad Inns on Regent. Um, and he was repainted to back to his original color. So painting over those uh, Canadian tire colors. And he's been there ever since. Again, as that um, symbol of goodwill and welcoming into the community of Transcona. Um, what else? But over the years uh, during the festival, other individuals have dressed up as High Neighbor Sam uh, to participate uh, in the festival activities. And here at the museum, we actually have uh, Wayne Tucker was an individual in Transcona who dressed up. There's been a number of individuals over, over the years who've dressed up as High Neighbor Sam. But uh, Wayne Tucker, we have his hat and vest and cane from when he dressed up as High Neighbor Sam. Uh, here at the museum in our collection. We have a number of the hats mm -hmm. uh, that I wish someone would make those again during the High Neighbor Festival so I could get one <laughs> because I really want to put one on at one of those, uh, their styrofoam hats that have the High Neighbor uh, banner across. But we can't do that. We can't put on the hats that nope. we have here at the museum. I really, really want to, but um, unfortunately, we can't. So until someone remakes them for a High Neighbor Festival in the future, I'm just going to have to patiently, patiently wait. Um, but I know other individuals have dressed up as High Neighbor Sam. I know, for instance, Peter Martin has. He was dressed up as Sam during the 100th anniversary celebrations. Um, but other people have picked up the mantle and been Sam. So uh, do you have anything else to add about Sam? Um, the sculptor, um, George Brown, he was a local resident here in Transcona. He was also known for the, the White Horse statue um, that's in St. Francis Xavier. I think he was um, associated with the Golden Boy as well. Uh, he was a well-known sculptor, sculptor in Canada, so he created a lot of um, the larger uh, figures um, that dot the Canadian landscape. I think he also did the Viking out in Gimli. He did. Uh, so he's done, he's done a number. Uh, so we have a couple images in our collection, not of him making Sam, but no. of his studio and other works of art um, that he had. Um, yeah, so Sam initially started as a concept uh, of, you know, advertising concept, and then he became a logo or a mascot on paper. 
And then that transitioned into a physical representation. And so the High Neighbor Festival, unfortunately, the High Neighbor Festival has not been on for the past couple of years just due to COVID. But um, High Neighbor Sam still sits proudly right before Plessy's and uh, welcoming everyone into the community of Transcona, even though Transcona starts a little bit before that part on the road. Um, so if you comments here on Facebook, okay. um, I think the move happened in 2010, just before okay. the homecoming event. Yes. His head was originally an orbit, if you know what that means. Oh, he's one of those garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was a provincial thing and they were round garbage cans set around the province. So that's really interesting. And that he, he is currently owned by the High Neighbor Festival. Yes, the High Neighbor Festival owns Sam and uh, they, um, and any sort of advertising of Sam. So I know they had been uh, raising funds and I don't know if they still are to repaint him mm -hmm. again. Uh, there was information on the High Neighbor Festival's website um, the, I believe the last time I looked at it. So hopefully next year, fingers crossed, we can have a High Neighbor Festival again. And welcome again, everyone into the community. It's one thing pretty rare, um, sort of like within the communities within Winnipeg to still have a strong community festival. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that um, always, I found very, well, when I, I'm not originally from Transcona. So when I first came here to see this festival with all these people and all these traditions of the parade and saying hi neighbor and stuff, it really makes you feel like you're still in a tight knit community, even though we're now a part of the city of Winnipeg and not our own separate community. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, flamingos, we will talk about flamingos next. Yeah. Um, so from what I know of the history of the flamingo in Transcona, um, the, it started in the 1950s, 1960s, and a local doctor, Dr. McKay, uh, he and his wife will go down to Florida every year um, for a warm vacation. And around that time, it was becoming pretty popular to see pink flamingos in uh, as a lawn ornament in Florida. And also that's where flamingos are found. So it, it made sense, mm -hmm. right? So he, he thought this was quite wonderful and novel. So he purchased a few and brought them back to Transcona and he was the first individual to have plastic pink flamingos in his front lawn and it really took off from there and so then move forward a couple decades to the 75th anniversary in 1986 they decided they wanted a mascot for this festival so who better than to have a flamingo ployed the flamingo um, so we actually have him here I'll go get him. at the museum. If I can get his head down. <laughs> While Jen talks, I will go retrieve the flamingo. So he, he became the mascot for the 75th anniversary celebrations. And he has been, um, out in the community, um, ever since every now and again for the festivals. Um, there was a, oh, right. I was doing some research um, for our next small talk for next week, and his name was Rocky Roletti. And in the 80s, he had a anthem called Transcona, Transcona Anthem. And flamingos were a very prominent lyric within the song. Um, we're just getting Floyd's head here. So that really reinforced a lot of the Transcona Flamingo connection. So not only does it get the Transcona Flamingo connection, but it also gets the railroader connection because he was a railroading flamingo. Uh, I think also in the 80s, that was around the time where like neon be yes. started becoming popular and flamingos and that they sort of made a comeback. So they decided on a, a railroading flamingo. So he's got his conductor hat. Um, this is something that in, people have borrowed and they've worn it to events. We've worn it in the parade yep. and, and stuff like that here in Transcona. Um, he's, a, he's made it into exhibits here every once in a while as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we can, we put Floyd uh, into the exhibits. Um, also, but like once Transcona started becoming known for flamingos, it did sort of catch on. At one point, the downtown business association downtown merchants association had a campaign and it was think pink think transcona and apparently they painted the curbs in the downtown area pink 
and um, different logos over the years of different businesses have included the flamingo. Um, there have been drag like Transcona dragon boat teams that are flamingos. So people have really embraced this flamingo as the um, this unofficial official mascot. Right. Um, even us here at the museum. <laughs> uh, at one point, I got a little flamingo uh, pen that was um, like in a silent auction sort of thing. And um, it's got crazy hair that crazy feathers off the top of his head. So we've nicknamed him Einstein. And he gets into shenanigans all over the museum, usually around Christmas time yep. when the elf on the shelf makes an appearance too. He'll be, you know, playing in the collections. He gets into display cases. He does things like that. So and he has a friend now, Indigo. Yes. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen him on social media. And some of our actual flamingo items that we do have in our collection, because we have some, are actually on display right now. So if you were to come into the museum and, and go into our back gallery, we do have some of the flamingos on display. Um, we do have larger flamingos. So we have like two paper mache flamingos that were recently on display at the Manitoba Crafts Museum. For their Manitoba 150 exhibit, they wanted items of uh, handcrafted uh, Manitoba history. So they borrowed those and those were made also for the 75th anniversary. Uh, we have a bride and groom flamingo yes. in our collection that I think also came from the 75th anniversary. We have pictures of them. They were in the parade. Uh, there was a whole uh, series of, uh, you know, decorated flamingos that people had done up. So it, there were different themes. So there was the bride and groom one. There was I think a Hawaiian theme. S something like that. So we have the bride and the groom and they have the bride has a wedding dress and a <laughs> veil and the groom has a little tuxedo on. Um, uh, but different businesses, like I know the beer boutique right now, they have a flamingo um, mascot uh, with their logo. But around Transcona, you will see that flamingo flamingo logo. And the community's just embraced mm -hmm. the flamingo, even though it's initially, uh, I don't know the reasoning behind the flamingo, but th my best guess is it's just, it was pop it was in popular culture at the time. So they, they, they gravitated toward it but Transcona has definitely really embraced the flamingo and I can remember um right when I was starting uh work here at the museum I told a friend who was originally from Winnipeg and I said oh yeah I'm starting work at the Transcona museum and he he said oh you're gonna have to find out about the flamingos and I was like <laughs> find out about the flamingos I had no idea so and it's a popular question we get asked all the time um if you know we have visitors to the museum when we're doing walking tours or any other type of events it's what is this deal with the flamingo like mm -hmm. it, it's really well known yeah there's a flamingo crossing there's mm -hmm. there's there's lots of flamingo aspects to transcona which is is unique in itself you know it's unique to our community's history and it's it's great that it's stuck around and it's flamingos also in popular culture are making a a comeback yes within the past on trend again on trend so um seeing that more and more as well so have I seen a flamingo shirt and almost bought it so I could wear it to work? Yes, yes, I couldn't absolutely couldn't, couldn't find it in my size, but uh, you know, one of these days I will. <laughs> um, so that brings us around to our our last kind of iconic um aspect of trans Transcona, which is the railway. It's kind of the big one, right? And Transcona's origins are this industry, the railway industry. Um, a blue collar town so definitely like it, our origins are with the railway i mean if the the transcona shops hadn't been built this community would likely not exist it would not exist as it is in fact until the the shops were being built there was no community of transcona here no. there was a community or an area called Monte Vista. There was another community area called Southwin, sort of within our boundaries of Transcona today, which they were they were farming communities mostly. Um, you know, not these big, you know, I can say industrial towns, right? That mm -hmm. Transcona really quickly came to be once the railway um it was decided they were going to build it here. Yeah, the boom shot up. Not to say that there weren't people already living in the area, mm -hmm. but it was it was farmland, it was um not con not a bunch of people concentrated to the area and then over time as 
uh, the community's grown and developed. Um, there's definitely different aspects of the railway that because the shops are still here. They're not as big and as prominent as they once were. There aren't as many people working there. It's not the sole economic provider for most of the people in the community as it once was, but it's still here. It's still op in operation. Um, but over time, as the, the community's grown and developed, there's definitely been those, those um, I'm trying to think of the word, um, callbacks to that um, significant railway history. So if you're walking down Regent Avenue, you will see a lot of railway lanterns on local businesses. And that was, again, something that was done in the 90s, I believe, with the Downtown Merchants Association. Again, they're the precursor to the Transcona Biz. So there's that aspect, you know, and they had for a period of time, the Transcona Festival did not happen. And there was another festival called Transcona Is. It was a one day festival and Transcona is industry. Transcona is uh, a place to live, uh, you know, all these things. And so some of those lanterns still have those Transcona Is banners on them. Um, and they're all throughout the downtown area and on some of the other businesses sort of close by as well, that we have one on the side of the museum along Bond Street. But even with the 100th anniversary and, and all that um, growth and development with the, um, the, the square, the Centennial Square, um, CN sponsored the, the clock tower that's there. Um, within the, the Archambault stage, there was sort of a pull, some of the artistic elements are to remind of the railway there's aspects of that. The new archway that goes across sort of um, as you come into the, the business district of Transcona, it has a very industrial mm -hmm. look. Um, and what's really cool is when the underpass was done uh, at Plessy's and yeah, Plessy's and Dougald right, right there, that underpass, if you look on the concrete of the um, I don't know, they're not retaining walls, but the concrete of the structure, there are train wheels and railway imagery in there, which is, which is really cool. Uh, we've got the murals. We have the murals. I mean, Transcona itself comes from a railway, railway history. It's a uh, trans from the Transcontinental Railway and Kona from Lord Strathcona, who was the one that nailed in the last bike uh, for the Canadian Pacific Railway in the 1800s. Um, you know, we have people that tell us all the time if we're on a walking tour or something like that, like, you know, they remember, you know, their grandparents taking, you know, old lumber from railway cars and stuff like that to build their homes. Yeah, uh, it just even recently, uh, yeah, a number of people saying, oh, that was built with railway lumber. Someone was telling us a story of someone apparently with workers at the shops at some <laughs> points theft was a bit of a, a problem people taking things home you know to build things like east end community club that was so, a big one. some of the the supplies that originally built that one were from the shops but uh the story we heard was a gentleman he was leaving the shops with a wheelbarrow worth of sand and the security guard or whoever was there was going through the sand to make sure he wasn't stealing anything Apparently um, it was taking the wheelbarrow, yeah. but I didn't think of that. But that's a story that we heard. That was from a walking, walking tour. tour I did last week. Yeah. Um, even like the, the placement of a lot of the businesses, right? Um, in this traditional downtown area, it's because, you know, the, the, the shop gates are right at Bond and Pandora. So, you know, there's a high concentration of, you know, the old banks used to be here, the, the hotels, uh, the lumber yards, mm -hmm. um, because that's that's where everybody streamed in and out. Because we've heard that when the shop whistle, when the shift change happened at its peak, it could take 30 minutes for all the workers to walk out of the shop's main gate. So if you were driving your car at that intersection, you just had to wait for mm -hmm. all the crew um, to walk out. Because while there was a shop's train that would take people to Winnipeg if they didn't live in the community, a lot of people at its peak did live here in Transcona. So they would walk out at shifts change. And if you have four, a couple thousand people changing over on shift, that's a lot. It's going to take a lot of time to clear that, um, that area. I mean, the community even had a locomotive uh, donated to it. So um, when the CN2747 
that's our get on board logo was um, pulled up, pulled from service. It was donated to the community, to the Kiwanis Club to be on display as a representation of the history of the community and where the community had come from and the significance to the railway, to the community, but also to Manitoba and Canada. The 2747 was the first steam locomotive built in the Western region and it was built right here at the Transcona shops. It came off the line on April 19th, 1926. And it was the first of 33 locomotives built here at the Transcona shops. So there's that history. I mentioned the murals earlier. Yep. Some of the initial uh, murals that were done in the community, there were three very specifically that represented aspects of the railway. There's the one on this side of the Transcona post office that shows railway workers sort of like inside at the shops. Um, there's one which is on the old TD bank building, which is going to be covered up very soon, we've heard, yep. um, depicting the 2747. And the one that was on the Transcona Curling Club, which unfortunately was covered up, depicted the Transcona shops ban. So three representations right there of the shops in the community. Uh, I, I mean, and... Uh, Quinlan's, for example, like that, right. that's, you know, Quinlan, he was uh, one of the general contractors uh, hired to build the shops complex and his son assisted him and his, they both served in the First World War. Um, and his son, unfortunately, was killed in action. So he's on the Senate half uh, here in Transcona. But, you know, Quinlan's is uh, a callback to another, to the railway history. Um, you know, so there, there, there are little nuggets of history mm -hmm. that all relate back uh oftentimes we're approached by local businesses that want historical photos to put to put inside or um, to create art for in their business so uh, if you go into the transcona access center there are large murals in there depicting sort of the uh, history of the community of Transcona. There's a big image of the 2747. But if you actually look at the floor, um, it's actually been designed to look like railway tracks, uh, like railway, um, not the tracks, the ties? ties, railway ties, as you go through the access center. A uh, number of other businesses have have gotten images from the museum to put them up to uh, embrace the history of the community. And a lot of them are the railway images. Uh, in fact, the museum's original logo was the 2747. Uh, interestingly enough, before we even owned it, <laughs> it was our logo. We often have people coming to the museum and they want to know more about the railway history. And, uh, and sometimes they, they might be disappointed when they come into the museum that there isn't more railway stuff on display, but I often have to say railway stuff is quite large and we're quite small. Mm -hmm. And up until a few years ago, we didn't even have a locomotive. Uh, and it's too big to fit in the building. We would need a, it, it wouldn't fit. We've measured it. It's, it's not going to happen. So uh, we have launched a capital campaign to build a protective structure over the 2747. And part of that is to also increase paths to it, to increase the accessibility to it so that we can bring the public in and talk more about the history of the railway, the 2747, and uh, the community of Transcona's early development and having that accessible to, to everyone. It's on display, you can walk by it right now and look at it, but once we have the structure, we'll be able to take you inside and you'll be able to get up into the cab safely because uh, we're gonna have some stairs built and, and things like that. So. You know, there's there's the railway is still significant. CN, although at the shops, it's not as busy there, or they don't have as many people employed. They did just a few years ago build a, a like an education center. It's just further down uh, Pandora, but the CN training center, and there are thousands. No not thousands, hundreds of students mm -hmm. that go through there every couple of weeks, learning their trade to work on the railway. And every once in a while, we have uh, we have some of the students come into the museum and it's just like, a, we heard that there was a museum, you know, we're, we're exploring the community. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're meeting a lot of people that way. We've set up some pop-up exhibits uh, at the CN Training Center when they've had different events going on. So, you know, you know like the, the railway, it's not 
as big of an industry as it was when this community first started, but it's still a significant industry within Canada and North America for moving goods and services and people, uh, people around. So, so I think it'll always, Transcanada will always have this tie, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So those are our sort of three top icons of Transcona. Uh, if anyone watching has any others that maybe we missed or, you know, you can leave it in the comments and, and we might be able to talk about it now. But if you're watching this after the fact, after it's gone off live, either on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, because we post these up on YouTube, leave it in the comments and, you know, we might be able to do a second version of this talk. Yeah. of other other uh, icons that we've missed. But yeah, we just wanted to have a discussion uh, talk today, but um, next week, our last uh, small talk for the summer session will be um, the Transcona Connection. So looking at different people and historical events and how it ties back to Transcona, some of which are, oh yeah, like I know that individual, others are like, really? Really? Yeah. Ooh, we are related? that to this historical figure person place thing event happened is connected somehow with transcona hmm. so that one's been kind of fun some of them are you know yeah true and some of them are rumored uh so if you are watching this and you have a you know an interesting transcona story transcona connection um uh, leave us that in the comments too and we'll see if that's one that we've already mentioned in or maybe one that we didn't know about and we'll talk about it uh during the next small talk yes so thank you so much for joining us uh again today and we hope that you'll join us next week yeah and it'll be taking place again at 12 noon uh here on facebook live and if you can't watch it at that time don't worry we do post them also on our youtube channel but they're always able to view after the fact on facebook as well all right okay thanks for joining us thank you to everyone who actually left us comments and what was watching today and i hope you all have a great day